up in New Jersey, still live there. Um, I majored in history in college, and I've always had a great love of history. I was always an avid reader. I remember my childhood, we, I was lucky enough to grow up in a house filled with books. I'd finish one book and have a discussion with members of my family about what to start next. So reading has been one of the great pleasures in my life, and I, I never really thought I'd become a writer. Um, I was a cellist and a music teacher um, after college, and then I was home with babies, and I started to think about what I could do at home. And a friend of mine had said, um, why don't you try copy editing? There was a freelance copy editing course that I took in uh, New York, and I enjoyed it because I loved the written word. I just, you know, just it was fun for me to correct manuscripts. and. I remember I worked on one manuscript that was a biography of Thomas Jefferson. And I was making corrections and suggestions, and I thought, well, why don't I try it? And my mother, and she was a great one for trying things. And I think the most important thing I learned from her was um, sort of a corny motto, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I, I, I tried to live by that, so I called the editor for whom I was doing the copy editing and said, well, gee, Joyce, um, I have an idea for a book. Uh, would you like to hear about it? Would you like it? Do you think you'll buy it? And Joyce, the editor, said, just give me three chapters and um, send it in. And if we like it, great. And if not, then we'll tell you. So I thought, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I, I had no clue that I could write a book. I mean, I was the type of person, I read everything, but um, Writing just seemed like something that I would never do, but it was a great, great experience. My experience copy editing helped my writing tremendously because, well, I was confident about punctuation, and as trivial as that sounds, it, it's actually very important to work your way around a sentence and to structure a sentence, and I'm, I'm a big one for thinking about each sentence. When I write, I'm kind of slow and steady, and I liken it to bricklaying. You know, you, you sort of build up your paragraph, and you, one paragraph leads to another, and then you have a chapter, and slowly accruing paragraphs and sentences, you, you eventually get to the end of the book. It, for me, it's a process. My first book was on Mary Cassatt, the, the American woman who went over and became the first French Impressionist. And that was a lot of fun. And um, one thing led to another, and now I'm on my 10th. Having grown up in suburban New Jersey, it, it wasn't exactly the obvious thing. But I've always been in love with the Western land, and I love horses. Um, even though I'm not an expert rider, I kind of just, you know, hope I don't fall off. I'm that kind of rider, but I've, I've always just been in love with the beauty of watching horses running the happy feeling of being on a horse. And I associate that with the West, because I ride Western saddle. And family trips to Glacier National Park, to Yellowstone, uh, to Yosemite, um, the space, the beauty, the, the kind of, the sense of patriotism it, it makes me feel. I'm, I'm just so in love with this country, and I think the West is such a great part of that. I think I came into it naturally because I've always loved to read about the West. Um, my favorite books are Western books, and it, Larry McMurtry, and I love Lucia Robson's books, um, Ride the Wind and Ghost Warrior, which I just finished reading and I was bowled over by. Um, Stephen Ambrose, his book Crazy Horse and Custer, way before I'd written anything of a Western subject, I was in love with that book. I think I've read it three times. I just think that was a brilliant book. Uh, Robert Utley's The Lance and the Shield, the biography of Sitting Bull, wonderful book. So, um, you know, I, I naturally, after I finished my Mary Cassatt book, I naturally uh, thought, what will I read, what will I write next, what will I propose next, and hope that I get a proposal accepted. And I hit on uh, George Catlin, who was an intrepid, sort of crazy dreamer, who um, went up the Missouri in 1832 and three, 
um, on the steamboat Yellowstone. One of the first, well, Bodmer, I think, was first, but Catlin was one of the very early Eastern guys who ventured up the Missouri and with the view to, um, with the goal of painting the Indian tribes. And, you know, he, so that was my second book. And after that, well, you know, when, when you're doing research, you stumble on other characters that you want to write about. Well, I always knew about Frederick Remington, and, and I just love his work, and especially the painting, The Fall of the Cowboy, that snow scene with, where the cowboys are, are um, riding up against a barbed wire fence, and they have to stop and open the gate. And uh, it's so evocative and so just kind of sad and beautiful at the same time. Um, so Remington was my third. And then, of course, it, if you do Remington, you necessarily want to do Russell. Um, I just naturally gravitated toward Western subjects. Um, I edited the, uh, Boots and Saddles, which is Libby Custer's memoirs. And that was really interesting, because she was a really good writer. And her life was kind of tragic. Um, obviously, after Custer was killed at the Little Bighorn, she put on black and she wore black for the rest of her life. And I think she lived to be 90 or some advanced age. And she kind of, the rest of her life was dedicated to burnishing his image and kind of, you know, there was a, a real backlash against Custer. And here was Libby. She, basically, her life was a shrine to his memory. So that was really fun, really interesting to edit her memoirs and then well of course then I did the the Charlie Russell book which was great fun because he was such a fun guy fabulous sense of humor and obviously a wonderful artist but when you're writing a biography um, it's really important to get into the character and what makes him tick and and you you it really helps when you like your character um, one thing I loved about Russell was his kindness to animals. He's, he was wonderful to his horses, and he didn't even like to hunt because he, he just was a very gentle man, and he, he didn't like to kill anything. And in fact, there's a really funny anecdote. Um, he had a house, a little uh, summer place on, on, in Glacier, what's, what is now Glacier National Park, and there was a skunk that burrowed under his porch steps, and he, he wrote to a friend, well, you know, I can't bring myself to get rid of it, but he, he seems to like the place. And that was Charlie. On, in 2010, I wrote a book on Chief Joseph in the Nez Perce War of 1877. Well, that was a, a, a real change of pace because, you know, after um, kind of the lightness of writing about someone so happy and, and funny and successful as Charlie Russell, you know, then I studied the Nez Perce War and, and, and all the tragedy and, and the courage and the suffering and the endurance of those people. And strange to say, in, in my, when I write a book, it, you know, I really kind of internalize it. Um, I took from the Chief Joseph book and all of my reading about it um, an example of human courage. Um, and. I try to use that in my own life. Um, you know, you think of what people can endure when they, and they, when they just keep going. It's just, it, it was unforgettable. It was very moving and, and unforgettable. And that book, every book that I write in, in some kind of way changed, changes my life a little bit. And I'm sure other writers feel the same way. And I think that the book on the Nez Perce Indians had, had a really profound effect on me. First of all, I love writing for children. I love, uh, I write nonfiction, histories and biographies, as you know. And I love writing for children because I think that history is just a bunch of incredibly exciting stories, and people should look at history that way. Um, and history gets such a bad rap in the schools. The textbooks are so kind of deadly with the subheadings and, you know, they're, they're just little snippets of fact and, and you don't get the meat of, 
or, or the juice of the story. And um, kids will say, I hate history. And, but how can you hate history if, it, if it's taught right? Because it's, it's nothing but a, a great story. And everybody loves a story. I think that people should know the history. And people should be, you know, proud of the history, know about the tragedies, know about the great things, and, and know where we came from. I think that a lot of people now, I'm not sure why it is, but a lot of people think 1960 is ancient history. You know, of course I'm a little older, so for me, I remember it well, but um, I just think to be an American, you should, you should want to know your history. I mean, it's that simple. And it's not kind of a chore. It should be, wow, you know, if you're, if you live in the East Coast and, and you're flying over the Great Plains, you can look down and see the vast expanse of land and, and the farms. And, and from the air, you see these huge rectangle, rectangles of fields. And you should, it, it's so cool just to know that um, there was a time when there was, there were no farms. Um, you know, there was just uh, a sea of grass, and those the, the settlers who came out had no. If if you were in the central plains, they had very little water. They had very little timber, and they made their houses out of the earth, out of strips of sod. And their life was unbelievable. I mean, it was very hard, but there was a lot of beauty to it too. The one thing you should know about the sod busters, the sod houses, is that um, they were really permeable. Snakes came through the roof, mice burrowed in the walls. When it rained, you know, water dripped down your neck. And, and I heard stories of um, pioneer women who would be cooking, making stew over the stove and holding an umbrella over their head. So this is from a little song called Starving to Death on a Government Claim. And, and this is written from experience, you have to know. How happy I am as I crawl into bed, the rattlesnakes rattling a tune in my head, while the gay little centipede, so void of all fear, crawls over my neck and into my ear. And the gay little bedbug, so cheerful and bright, he keeps me a-going two-thirds of the night. And since this, I wrote this book for children, I'm, I love to put in quotes um, the peop of things about people's childhood. And one, one woman who had come to Custer County in 1884 wrote in her memoir, and she wrote this when she was an old woman, one of the vivid recollections of my childhood is of those pioneer days, dewy summer mornings, millions of prairie flowers everywhere, frogs croaking, prairie chickens booming, and ducks quacking in that, their own country. And, and one pioneer, one such person, is a man named Jules Homont. And this is what he, he looked back on his youth, and this is what he wrote. Actually, this is from a lecture or a talk that he gave to some people about his, the old pioneer days. And he wrote, we came here to this beautiful country in those early days, young, strong, healthy, filled with hope, energy, and ambition. Poor, it is true, oh, how poor in worldly goods, but rich beyond dreams in everything that makes life worthwhile. I do not know how large a bank account some of the old settlers may have today. I do not care. They will never be as rich as I felt when I first settled on my homestead. I remember the time I did not have the money to buy a postage stamp. I remember the hard winter, the drought of 1894, the many obstacles to overcome. We came to win the battle, and we did. I should say, I should mention about Solomon, the photographer who took 3,000 pictures of his friends and neighbors, the sod busters. He hated farming, and, and everyone thought he was really lazy, and because he just, he had a camera and, and a wagon and a horse, and he put the camera in a little dark room in, in the back of his wagon. He kind of rigged up a little little covered area and with a dark room and he just traveled all over Custer County and Nebraska and pretty much and, and some of the other plain states but pretty much stayed in Nebraska for most of his work uh, photographing the pioneers 
And as I said in the beginning, people thought he was an oddball and a little bit nutty because why wasn't he farming like everyone else? He, they thought he was lazy and he just couldn't stand the work, but he, this was his work and it was his dream. And he, in fact, um, he, so he had, he amassed a collection of about, of more than 3,000 amazing photographs and they are just beautiful. And so he, he was the one who created the, the best, the most extensive record of the Sodbuster era ever. And so he photographed really a whole period of history. And I'll tell you, one of the joys and the hard thing, uh, things about this book was that I had so many pictures to choose from, you know, and, and that was tough to, to actually narrow it down. I have 62 photographs in this and I could have, you know, gone a lot higher. Well, people will ask me, what's your book about? And I'll say Solomon Butcher. Pretty much I find that people don't know his name, but then I say, well, do you know the picture of the cow on the roof? You know, it's a very famous picture, and people say, oh, yeah, and people know that, but they don't know his name. So it was, you know, a really fun opportunity to get to, to kind of introduce him, and especially to young people. He had, Solomon had a great sense of humor. Um, so his pictures uh, range from, you know, beautiful sweeping, there's always the land, the land, the sweep of the land in the background. But he had, he liked to take little quirky pictures too. Uh, and they're funny and, and they, each of his pictures tells you a lot. It tells you because you can see the house in the background. You can, the family is usually standing in front. There are always a couple of dogs. The horses, they wanted to show off their possessions to the relatives back home. Because they're, you know, they didn't have Instagram. And <laughs> so, you know. Um, there were horses and cows in the fields in the back, and it was just, there's any number of variations of what he took. Because I'm such a Luddite, I, I had to be dragged kicking and screaming onto Facebook, and now I'm really glad that I was dragged, because um, it's a great way to keep up with your friends, and it's also a great way to let people know what you're doing. I, I put the picture, the, my cover for Light on the Prairie on Facebook. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm a convert to that, but for a long time I said, oh, I'm, I'm never going to do that. But, you know, you, you, you can't ignore the world around you. You have to try to keep current. Um, I felt the same way about ebooks when I, you know, even, even up until recently. I, Myself, I like to hold a book. I like the smell of a book. I like to turn the pages, curl up on my couch with my dog on my lap and a, and a good book. Um, but I know that ebooks are here to stay. I know that people love them. And I'm, I'm learning to like them a little because um, now I learned that my book of, on Eleanor of Aquitaine, which I wrote, I think in 2006 or seven, is going to be an ebook. So how can I argue with that? You know, my, the, the company that published that book, um, the editor said, well, we're going to give your book new life. Because, you know, a lot of books don't stay in print forever. So I'm happy about that. So I'll, I'll be dragged kicking and screaming into e-books as well. I, you know, it just takes me a little bit longer. But um, I've heard that it's, that it's getting more people to read. So again, that's a good thing.